All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, I know I've just prayed, but let me let me just pray again uh, as as we start. What a gift of grace you are to us, Lord Jesus. Um, we thank you. Thank you for what we've just been able to celebrate through the words of these songs. Um, yeah, I pray that as we come now to sit under your word, to hear from you, um, may you speak to us. May you transform us. Would your Holy Spirit be moving uh, within each one of us, drawing us closer to you, helping us to be more like you for the purpose of, purpose of bringing you glory uh, and honour in our lives uh, and in this world. And so we pray for that gift now as we, um, as we try and hear what you're uh, trying to say to each one of us this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, so this week, um, a quiet little op shop um, caused a little bit of a stir online. I don't know if anyone um, has an idea of what I'm talking about, but it was a little, uh, a local Vinnie's in Tamworth. Um, and uh, this week they were selling a, a handbag at this little op shop. Um, this is the, the handbag. Um, didn't buy it for Tamara. Did, did anyone hear about this through the week? Yeah. It's, is it real or not real? Yeah, that's the question. But do you, the reason it caused controversy, do you know, Paul, how much it was being sold for? It was two thousand, two thousand dollars for this handbag at an op shop. So not your typical op shop bargain. Um, uh, so why why was it that this little op shop in Tamworth uh, was selling this bag for two thousand um, dollars? The reason is it was actually uh, when the donation came in, they realised that what they might have on their hands was a bag produced by the luxury fashion brand uh, Balenciaga. Um, and ordinarily, this bag would retail for four thousand dollars. So, at, at two grand, it's actually quite a bargain. Um, might have a few of us popping up to Tamworth to see if it's still available. Um, and so, while the team at the at the, the local Vinnies didn't realise the value of this bag at the time, um, as they as they started looking at it, they all of a sudden they were shocked and excited by what they might have on their hands. Uh, they said that they get quite a lot of knockoffs, so they get lots of knockoff bags that uh, get donated. Um, and so when they get something that might be real, they have there's all these checks that they do. So uh, this is what one of the team members said uh, in an interview. <laughs> uh, there are a few things that you can you can look at to verify the knockoffs. There are things in the logo that you need to look for, things like the quality of the leather, the finishings the brass fixtures, the stitching, there's quite a range of things you can check and then eventually it's a process of elimination. We get lots of handbags and see good knockoffs all the time, so we're confident that this is kosher. Um, we did as much investigation as we, as we can locally, um, but we don't have anywhere we can take it, so there's no authenticity certificate, but we believe that it's genuine. So on the surface, this bag looks like it's the real deal. Um, uh, I'd, uh, ideally, we'd have a certificate of authenticity to confirm that it's legit, um, but it looks like it's real. Um, and today, we're going to be considering what does genuine faith look like? What, what does authentic faith look like? How do you look below the surface to see if it's real, genuine faith or whether it's a cheap knockoff? Um, there's a big difference between looking faithful and actually being faithful. And so in our passage today, which is in Mark chapter 12 from verse 38 to 44, uh, it's going to be looking at the contrast between faith which is authentic and that which isn't. And so as we do this, as we explore this idea of what it looks like to have authentic faith, there's going to be three points that we're going to be considering uh, from the passage uh, and that is uh, how we see authentic faith in giving to self, uh, giving uh, in faith, uh, and the idea of given for us. So, <clears throat> our first point, uh, giving for self. Uh, let's, let's start by getting into our passage for today. 
So in Mark 12, we're just going to read the first half of it. If you've got your Bibles, it's Mark 12, 38 um, to 40. As he taught, Jesus said, Watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted with respect in the markets and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honour at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. These men will be most severely or be punished most severely. So in this particular scene that Mark is describing for us, it's Jesus has been teaching in the temple. We've heard over the last few weeks how Jesus has been debating the, the, the Pharisees and the scribes. Uh, They've been asking him lots of questions to try and get him to trip up and say something that will make him lose his popularity um, or even something that will get him arrested. Um, Jesus is becoming so popular that he's drawing people away from them and therefore their power and their status is being threatened. Uh, And while Jesus has been comparatively diplomatic while he's been teaching in the temple so far, Uh, In our passage today, he's no longer talking in riddles, um, but openly warning the crowds of the dangers of the religious leaders. He starts off by saying, watch out, beware of these teachers of the law. Why is it? What do they, why do people have to be worried about them? Well, first of all, it's because their supposed devotion to God was primarily self-serving. As religious leaders in their day, their positions afforded them immense power and authority. Um, Back then was a very different time in history. Um, There was no universal education um, to give high rates of literacy um, or easy access to the Bible for the general population. So for most regular people, they wouldn't be able to read God's word for themselves and would rely on the public reading of scripture and listening to the explanations given by these religious leaders, the experts. Um, This this meant that being a teacher of the law was both a prestigious and powerful position. And and that kind of social prominence was one of the perks of the job that the leaders of the day absolutely loved. Jesus says they like to walk around in these flowing garments, these white prayer robes that were ornate, uh, they, uh, as well as being outward symbols of their devotion to God, they were signs of, uh, of being wealthy and being prominent in society. Maybe a little bit like a Balenciaga bag um, these days. And as they walked through the streets, people would be expected to rise and greet them. Um, uh, in religious and social events, they would strive for the best seats in the house. Um, They loved the public adoration and honour that came with being devoted to God. (laughs) And today, uh, long flowy robes and a theology degree probably doesn't give the same level of public adoration as it did back then, Uh, but there are no doubt modern equivalents. Um, And maybe maybe a similar measure is no longer having the best seats in the synagogue, but rather the biggest platform on social media. There are modern celebrities who are revered and honoured. They have influence, they have status and wealth, um, and often it's self-serving and superficial. Um, And church leaders are no exception to that. Um, Often we, when we look at the, you know, celebrity church leaders, we, we can measure their success by the size of their platform, how many people are following them. Um, We often associate that with, well, if they've got this many followers, how successful must they be? How how spiritual must they be? It's easy for us to assume that the most faithful ones are the ones with the biggest platforms. Or maybe we see the most faithful or devoted people as people who go overseas to do mission work. They're the really spiritual ones. Um, But whatever the case, we we can too easily fall into the same trap as 2,000 years ago. We assume outward markers of success or devotion to God equate to faithfulness or closeness to him. For the scribes and the Pharisees, their education, knowledge of the law and social standing meant that people assumed these were the most devoted, most spiritual people around. 
had spent a lifetime studying, devoted to God's word. Um, Surely these were the people who God loves the most and who are closest to him. Yet, for all their superficial devotion, their motivations revealed their faith to be inauthentic. They preferred to be seen as faithful and enjoy the praise that that brought rather than actually being faithful. It looked like they were giving to God, but in reality, they were giving to themselves. In the book of John, there's a passage that talks about how some of these scribes and Pharisees did actually believe in Jesus, but were held back in this faith because they were too worried about what others thought. Um, So it's in John 12, 42 to 43, and it says, Many even among the leaders believed in Jesus, but because of, the, because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear they would be put out of the synagogue. And it says, for they loved human praise more than praise from God. I personally find this to be a pretty devastating passage. They were too scared of what others thought. They were too busy getting their approval from others. Their lives were lived basking in the approval of others and they became addicted to that approval. So much so that when the moment came for them to do something for God that others might not approve of, they didn't have the courage for it. They'd spent their lives getting validation from others rather than validation from God. Who am I looking for my recognition or validation from? Am I striving for the external markers of success that will give me recognition or approval from other people? Or am I willing to be faithful and devoted to God even if others might not approve or agree? So this was the first condemnation of the teachers of the law. Their devotion was self-serving. They liked to give the impression that they were seeking to honour God, but in reality they were only looking for honour themselves. Yet for the teachers of the law, there is worse condemnation to come. Uh, In verse 40 of our passage, the second half of it, uh, Jesus warns the people, um, uh, the second reason Jesus warns the people is because these teachers of the law would often abuse their positions of spiritual authority for this selfish gain. Jesus says they were people who would devour, literally consume the houses of widows. And then for a show, to make a cover for this, they would do these long, drawn-out prayers to make it seem like it was a spiritual thing. Now, it likely wasn't all the teachers of the law, it wasn't all of them that were doing this kind of thing, but certainly it was prevalent enough in their ranks um, that many of them were taking advantage of some of the most vulnerable in society. These long prayers were designed to make it seem like a spiritual thing and just to help them get away with lining their own pockets. And this is clearly not an issue that's restricted to 2,000 years ago either. Spiritual abuse, uh, that is church leaders or people with spiritual authority, using this authority to take advantage of, of others is both heartbreaking and devastating. Whether it's financial abuse, sexual abuse, Emotional manipulation, there are far too many examples of church leaders falling into this type of sin. And the damage it does to people and to the name of Jesus is extraordinary. It's no wonder that Jesus says the judgment on these leaders will be severe. And at its core, it's still the same issue. These teachers of the law were self-serving and selfish in their faith. Their giving to God was only really a means of giving to themselves. In Matthew 6, uh, uh, Jesus says this. He says, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. This is the key to protecting our hearts. The key in this verse is practicing their righteousness to be seen by others. What's the reward that we're looking for? There's nothing wrong with practicing our faith publicly. The issue comes to our motivations. We need to assess our hearts. What's the reward that we're looking for? Is it for the validation of others? Is it being seen by others? Or is it being seen by our Heavenly Father? 
And so if the teachers of the law are examples of trying to honour honor themselves with their superficial devotion, caring more about uh, what others thought than what God thought, what's the kind of authentic devotion that, that Jesus is actually looking for here? He answers this in the next part of our passage today, um, which is sort of a second story in the section. So we're going to skim now to our second point, which is uh, giving in faith. And for this, we're going to be going to uh, verse 41 in Mark chapter 12. Uh, It says, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts. But a poor widow came in and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. I want us to try and imagine this scene that Jesus is uh, taking us into, or that Mark is taking us into. Um, I've put up here a a bit of an impression of what the temple at that time would have looked like. Um, Something that looked a little bit like that. You've sort of got the big, I don't know if this pointer, I've never used this before, there you go. You've got sort of the big temple area where you've got the, the, the Holy of Holies. But this court that Jesus is talking about here with the temple treasury is this area here. So this is the area. And so in this particular courtyard of the temple, there were 13 wooden chests where people could make different kinds of offerings to God. At the top of these chests were trumpet-shaped funnels that would sort of, you know, start nice and wide and go in, and then at the bottom of them would be these wooden chests. So this trumpet shape was, um, in one part, a a security uh, measure. Uh, so it stopped when you put when you'd put donations in. You couldn't then you know stick a hand in and grab a few more things. Um, but the other thing that this trumpet shape did is that it amplified the noise pe- made when people would come and give their donations. It meant that you could hear the clanging and rolling of coins as they went in, and potentially even hear the size of the den- denomination that was getting put in. Uh, it meant that listeners around had a pretty good idea of what was being donated. And so all around this area, there was wealthy people putting in large sums of money, and it was very obvious who the high rollers were. Everyone around could hear the sound of their coins bouncing down into the chest, particularly the larger ones that they would put in. There's the hustle and the bustle of the moving crowd, uh, along with this regular clanging of coins dropping down the funnel. But in the midst of all this wealth being thrown around, the chatter of the crowds, even the, you know, the distinction of the scribes and Pharisees that would have been walking around. There's a figure in this place that doesn't seem to fit. One so comparatively insignificant that she may as well have been invisible. She wasn't anyone of note, nor did she have anyone with her. After her husband passed away, life had been challenging. She would try and find pieces of work, little ways to earn enough each day to fill her stomach, in amongst paying for the other expenses and taxes that were required at the time. Um, Some days she had success and other days she didn't. Um, On the days she didn't, she relied on the compassion of others, a few small coins or some spare, uh, or people with some food to spare to keep her going. With no husband, she had no stable income, no real standing in society, and was one of the most vulnerable people in the community. Maybe she was even one of these uh, widows that the, the, the scribes and teachers of the law would try and take advantage of. She was overlooked, unseen, with no safety net to speak of. And yet here she is at the temple treasury, weaving her way through the crowd as she approaches these wooden donation chests. Maybe trying not to draw too much attention to herself, she reaches up and drops in all she can afford, these two copper coins. And as these two coins slide down the funnel, her meagre donation lands in the chest with just a faint little click. Uh, Maybe some of the people around her notice her at this point, surprised by uh, by these small thuds of the two coins landing in the chest. 
Some of the people would, might wonder why she even bothered. The amount that she put in was like pouring a cup of water into the ocean and expecting to see the water levels rise. The amount was little more than a rounding error on a balance sheet, some loose change compared to the scale of the rest of the donations. To those watching, it revealed the desperate state of her affairs. It was yet another symbol of her poverty. Why did she even bother? Maybe even a little embarrassed, the woman shuffles away, back through the crowd again, anonymous and insignificant. Yet, there is a person who sees this woman. At the opposite side of the courtyard is Jesus, sitting quietly, watching and observing the comings and goings. And in the midst of all the wealth and prestige, this is the moment that catches Jesus' eye. To Jesus, these two copper coins tumbling down the trumpet funnels and landing in the chest uh, was a moment of spiritual significance. What others might have heard as faint uh, clinks of tiny coins, Jesus heard as loud thuds of devotion and humble faith. These were thuds that reverberated through about the courtyard for those who had ears to hear, overpowering the clanging of coins from the rich. What Jesus saw was of a spiritual value that far outweighed any material donation given that day. And Jesus tells this to his disciples, this widow put in more than anyone else. So let's consider together, why, why was it that this widow's offering was worth so much more to Jesus than anything else? What is Jesus teaching us and teaching his disciples by putting the spotlight on this overlooked and unseen widow? Well, firstly, it teaches us that God cares far more about the giver than he does the gift. This episode shows that Jesus is not, that, not actually that interested in the amount a person gives. In God's kingdom, the value of a gift is not equal to its dollar and cents value. If it was, the person putting in the most money in the donation chest would be the one receiving the commendation. Look at all the good that we could be doing with that big donation. I know if I'm honest and I check my own heart, if I was in a similar position, that's probably what I'd be drawn to as well. Um, think about all the good that you could do with this large sum of money. Surely that's the most valuable. But instead it was the smallest donation that's praised by Jesus. And what it reveals to us is that to God, the value of a gift is not so much the amount given, but actually the amount kept back. For the rich people, they were giving out of what they could spare, their leftovers. But the widow, she gave with nothing to spare. She held nothing back from her God. The amazing thing about it is that she could have also just given one coin. She could have just given half of what she needed to live on, but instead she gave it all, everything she had. When others gave out of, their, gave out of plenty, she gave out of poverty. And notice here that Jesus isn't condemning the wealthy. He's not saying that they should have been giving a higher proportion of their income or else they're, you know, they'd be sinning. Um, what Jesus is condemning is our human tendency to place more value on the amount of the gift rather than the dedication of the one who gives it. The immense value of the widow's gift was that it revealed her faith and devotion to God. She wasn't just giving God her money, she was giving God her heart and her trust. Consider the contrast to the previous story where Jesus spoke about the teachers of the law. They seemed to be the most devoted, the most religious, and yet their hearts were far from God. Um, God doesn't want our gifts. He doesn't want our money. He's the creator of the universe. Psalm 50 says, For every animal of the field, of, animal of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains and the insects in the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all that is in it. God doesn't need our gifts. He wants us. He wants you and me, and he wants our hearts to be devoted to him. God values the giver, not the gift. The gift is only a means of revealing the heart of the person giving it. 
And so the question I want us to take away from this is not how much money should I be giving to God. That's a practical question and maybe an important one to ask. But I think the far greater question we should be asking is, how can I give more of myself to Jesus? It doesn't have to be money. It can be time, energy, my skills or abilities. But how can I give in such a way that it reveals my devotion and gratitude to him? The thing that I find amazing about this is that it's, the, it's an ultimate leveller. Um, it doesn't matter who we are, we all have something to give that is of significant value to God. This poor widow gave more than all the wealth of the rich people around and showed more devotion to God than any of the religious leaders. It doesn't matter whether we're retired, living in a nursing home, whether we've got, we're busy with family life, single, whether we're at, a, at school, we all have something of value we can give to God, more valuable to him than all the riches of the world. We can give ourselves. We might not be material, some, for some of us, we might not be materially poor, but rather time poor. And so for us, what would it look like to give God out of our time poverty? In amongst deadlines, responsibilities and busyness, what if we chose to step out in faith and give to God an offering of our time? Maybe it's spending an extra 15 minutes with God in the midst of our busy days, or whether it's using our time like Alex was sharing uh, with us this morning to have a conversation with someone who desperately needed it. Whatever it is, when we give sacrificially, we're giving our hearts and our devotion to Jesus. And so that, uh, that's the first thing this story teaches us, is that God cares far more about the giver than he does the gift. And second, it reveals to us the value of giving in faith. This woman steps out in faith to make this donation, giving all she had to live on. And that meant that she was making herself totally dependent on God. Anyone can give from what they have left over, from what they don't need. You don't need to know Jesus to do that. Um, but this widow's gift was given out of faith. She was putting herself in a position where she was forced to trust God. She was putting herself in a position where faith was a necessity, not an add-on. This was a radical kind of sacrifice. And it's one that we'll only ever be able to do with the Holy Spirit working in our hearts. When we do, we go from a place of independence, trying to solve our own problems and, do, uh, and depend on myself to, to get through each day, to one where we're then depending on God, living by faith. If we go through our lives trying to be independent and never actually needing to trust God, we'll never actually grow in our faith. We'll stunt our spiritual growth and we'll, we'll rob ourselves of the, ability, of the opportunity to see God providing in ways far better than we could ever provide for ourselves. It will give us an authenticity to our faith. Because when we give to Jesus in faith, he multiplies our offering and grows our faith. Just like the young boy who gave Jesus his lunch, um, when we give to God, let's consciously give in faith. Um, one of the ways that this passage uh, challenged me personally um, brought me back to actually a conversation I'd had with Alex um, a, a number of times about what it looks like to be present as a parent. What does it look, what's the important thing about being present as a parent? And he used the example for, of, of, two, uh, of two different parents. For the first parent, um, maybe they're a stay-at-home parent and they spend their whole day uh, with their child or children. Um, but, you know, they've got a busy day, they've got lots of cleaning to do, they've got lots of responsibilities around the house, uh, lots of bits and pieces that have to get done, and they spend the whole day busily working to try and knock, off, knock things off their list. Um, but consider then another parent. Maybe this particular parent uh, works all day. They work long hours, and they only come back with you know, 15 minutes before you know, the, the kid has to have a bath and get ready for bed. Um, but in these 15 minutes, this parent gives their child completely undivided 
um, undistracted, complete focus uh, in that time. And so Alex's question was, well, which, <laughs> which of those two parents has given more to their child that day? Um, and what, which of those gives more benefit to the child? Um, in Alex's experience, the answer was the 15 minutes of uninterrupted, undistracted time. That is actually far more valuable and far more beneficial to a child than a whole day spent distracted. And so for me, I wondered if that actually can, has parallels in my own spiritual life. Uh, for me, as somebody who works for a church and studies at a Bible college, I can spend a whole day looking like I'm with God. Um, I'm writing essays about him, writing sermons, um, but in reality, I can spend a whole day thinking about God, but spending zero time actually with God. Um, actually being present, listening to him, seeking him. And compare that with maybe, you know, the busy parent um, who... Uh, in the midst of their day, they've put their child down and they've got 15 minutes of quiet. <laughs> uh, how are they going to choose to use that time? Are they going to get on top of the dishes that they never get the chance to do? Or are they going to sit down and say, God, I'm going to give this time to you? What's more valuable? Was it me sitting and writing an essay about God the whole day? Or was it that 15 minutes of faith, <laughs> choosing to be present with God? <clears throat> God looks beyond the surface. He looks at the heart. And so for me, my takeaway has been to spend more time with God, being present with him. Rather than only spending time, you know, reading books or writing essays, um, even if I'm anxious about the deadlines that are approaching and how I'm going to get things done. And I want to choose to be with him. Because then when I stop depending on my own strength to get all these things done, and start depending on God to be the one that provides for me. All of a sudden then, God gets the glory. <laughs> He's the one that gets the credit. Uh, it's as Alex shared again in the first service, he gave, he gave out of time that he didn't have. <laughs> and God, God provided for him and turned it into something so precious and so valuable. Um, to quote him again, if we step out in faith, the supernatural becomes natural. If we deliberately and consciously choose to trust God through prayer, I think we'll be amazed at the way that God provides for us. And so I want us to consider today, what might God be asking to give to him? Maybe it is our time. Maybe it's 15 minutes of a hectic day to be with him. Or maybe it's my downtime when I really, all I want to do is rest, um, but there's other ways that I can serve people. Maybe it is my energy when I'm tired and weary um, and finding a way to sit and listen to somebody who's lonely. Or potentially it is my money. How can I give to God what I was going to use for myself today and trust that God will be the one that provides for me? God takes our meagre offerings and turns it into something even greater. And this is what the widow teaches us. Giving in faith out of our poverty is something so precious to God and he will grow our faith to be authentic if we choose to trust him. And that's our second point, giving in faith. Um, our last point I've titled, Given for Us. So in the story today, this is actually the last, uh, the last moment in Mark's gospel that Jesus is doing public teaching. He's been going around for chapters and chapters, teaching and healing people, but from here on out, um, in, in Mark's Gospel, Jesus will do a little bit of private teaching of his disciples and then it's all leading up to the cross. And so in many ways, this final moment of public teaching is a really apt point to finish on. I, I really loved the way that um, one, of the uh, one of the Bible commentators, whose name is James Edwards, he summarised this wrap-up to Jesus' ministry. Um, no gift... Oh, if you click again. No gift, whether of money, time or talent, is too insignificant to give if it is given to God. And what is, what is truly given to God, regardless of how small and insignificant, is transformed into a pearl of great price. 
What may look like a great gift, conversely, may in reality be little in comparison to what one could give. The widow's offering, giving, the widow's giving all she had is a true fulfilment of the call to discipleship, to follow Jesus by losing one's life, which was in Mark 8.35. And so then, uh, in his commentary, he then, James Edwards then goes on to note that the way this passage ends with this widow laying down all she had is exactly what Jesus is about to do. Jesus was about to go to the cross to lay down everything, to lay down his life for our sakes. The sacrifice of the widow points again to the cross and the magnitude of what was given for us. And it's out of Jesus' sacrifice him giving first his own life that frees us to give of ourselves to him in gratitude and in love. He doesn't ask anything of us that he doesn't first do himself. He truly is the author and perfecter of our faith. And so as we, as we wrap up, I want to read a section of scripture from 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And I think it beautifully captures uh, in an example of the kind of authentic faith we've been talking about this morning. <clears throat> so, I'm um, oh, sorry, I've missed the reference there. I promise it is 2 Corinthians chapter 8 uh, and from verse 1. Uh, it says, And now, brothers and sisters, we want, we want you to know about the, the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first, first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. It's amazing all the, the parallels that this passage has with the story that we've just been talking about. The Macedonian church uh, that Paul is talking about here is just like the widow. They gave all they had beyond their ability. They sacrificed for others, but at their core they gave first to God in faith. And if we do the same, we follow in the footsteps of our God, who, like the widow, gave, um, gave out of his poverty... Um, and gave his grace to us. Lord, may we be characterised by that kind of authentic faith. Uh, we're going to finish now by listening to a song, um, and it's called Surrender by um, an artist by, named Lincoln Brewster. Um, but I want to use this as an opportunity for us just to sit and reflect. Let's consider, what might God be calling me to give to him in faith today? How can we grow in in authenticity and devotion in our faith. Um.